kind of hoping those numbers are, will happen in Canada maybe next year. Um, but I won't make that my, my uh, target for the year. Um, I also sort of thought, okay, so I'm keynoting on day two and it's going to have to be a little bit light. Um, there are people filtering in, but I sort of think, Justin, that, that maybe the dust of, of last night was, uh, is still getting shaken off a little bit. So, so I thought I would keep it a little bit light, but there's also some intriguing things that I think you'd all kind of want to see that I've been watching lately in the kind of effects that um, AI, machine learning, and this tech development is happening, and the knock-on effects that is happening through the labor changing um, and the workforce that we have, and, and so some of the things that are going to happen to us over the next short while. So recently, um, RBC did a, a study that revealed that 50% of jobs will likely be uh, disrupted by automation over the next 10 years, 50%. So that number shocked me, uh, to be fair. And then as I start thinking through what's even more surprising and more concerning is the majority of those people that will likely be affected aren't recognizing that they're going to be affected. 80% of that population is not concerned about their income stability and they aren't even aware that their jobs are going to be likely disrupted. And to compound that problem one step further, 35% of that population that doesn't know their income is going to be affected doesn't have savings that will cover their expenses over the next six months. So, uh, and, and, and I also saw on the CBC news recently where 50% of Canadians are $200 away from not being able to pay their bills, $200 away from not being able to pay their bills. So you have this sort of 50% of the population that's going to be affected over the next 10 years and not a strategy or um, an environment that's going to support the kind of things that are going to happen to that workforce. So we have a new task at hand and there's many implications to the, to the stats with respect, I think, to how people are trained, transition strategies um, for moving people into different roles, um, the education of younger and older people alike on what's going to happen over the next 10 years. But what I want to talk to you today is about, is about the financial services aspect of this change and the changing la um, labor market and how we're going to get past that. So I only have about 10 minutes. I'm going to show you some statistics and some, and, and some things that we should be thinking about as it's concerned to the workforce. The workforce is changing, but the financial services that supports that workforce is not changing fast enough. It's built on a nine to five traditional workforce where they have a consistent uh, um, income stream and they're offered access to financial services based on an old traditional model that I just don't think is going to work as we move through the, the, the changing environment. The problem is, is I don't know if people realize exactly how fast this is happening. So look at 1999. There was um, less than 10% of the workforce was made up of the millennial population. In just 15 years, this entire model has flip-flopped. Um, as you can see, uh, and what you, what, what's not up there is the Canadian population today, 28% of the population is made up of millennials. But 40% of our workforce is made up of millennials. And millennials, in case you don't know, but I'm sure you do, they think differently, they act differently, they aspire to different things, they are far more interested in working for themselves, they have a stronger desire to be self-employed, and they expect their employer to allow them to have the flexibility that allows them to do that. So this population um, is particularly important to me and, and PayPal. Not just because it makes up the majority, a high majority of my employee base, so I need to understand how we're gonna manage uh, our, our workforce accordingly, but it also makes up a majority of our customer base. So we've done some surveys ourselves and we found out that 58% of millennials that expect, they will expect to leave their job in just 
three years or less. And 25% of the millennial base, so one in four, already have multiple jobs. They have side gigs, they're doing things from five to nine, and you've seen a lot of studies that we've done on the five to niner study. Um, they aren't interested in the traditional form of getting you paid every two weeks um, and working through your career over a 20 year career and getting the watch, it wasn't an Apple watch, um, after, you, after you've been there for 20 years. They want something different. And it's our job now to figure out how do we help this. It's also a population that is incredibly motivated to use digital tools. They're gonna to use them in their personal, their professional, and their financial lives. I'm leaving you, uh, this slide up. I'm gonna cover it really quickly, but this is an app that's available in the US. It's only in the US today across the rest of the world. It is not available. It's Venmo. It's the number one app chosen by millennials in the US. It intersects social and financial. Um, it, people send money to each other. There's now a Venmo Pay. Um, in the um, last year, it grew 80%. This is a true hockey stick effect of what's happening when people, um, and millennials in particular, grab onto something that's important. This is over a four year period. Last year alone, uh, Venmo transacted $62 billion of payment volume. So clearly, we can't deny that, that the role that digital tools are playing in the financial services. And the question is, is are we ready for this? There's also been uh, data from Government Canada that says 25% of our existing workforce are either temporary work workers or self-employed. The internet has allowed us access to um, a varying degree of customer base. A, a small business um, or a person who, who has a product or service that they want to sell, they can now sell that easily. E-commerce and payment platforms are available everywhere. You can manage your business on your phone from wherever you are. They're probably back at the office right now managing their business while you're here. They can sell ship, manage their selling, all on a mobile phone. It's incredible. Um, and in fact, in, in, it's an interesting stat that um, people who used, a small business who used uh, PayPal grew 28 times faster than a traditional small business did in 2017. This, this space is strong. But here's the dilemma. The income that's associated with the small business is not consistent. So now you have this clash of the financial services model ex expecting and waiting for this consistent ongoing income and it's not being delivered in the way that our financial services want it to be. And so now you're a small business and you're trying to get access to money or loans or funds and you can't provide um, a bank or any other financial institution with with a consistent form of income, and so you're not able to fund your business. A little bit of a contrast that currently, all Canadian workers, actually 73% um, of them, do have a consistent income. So I think this is where some of the concern is, is how fast do we have to move? But as you saw in the way that the millennial population is changing quickly, this is why we need, I think, to speed up the, the rate at which we're thinking differently about um, income and how it's treated by financial services. Concerning stat, um, last year, 38% of workers in the freelance economy um, missed a bill payment and incurred a fee in 2018. 50% of small business owners incurred a fee by missing a bill payment. Because what happens is with this inconsistent income, but still the consistent requirement to pay rent and food and, and, and other bills that are given to you on a monthly basis, there hasn't been a, a, a good solution that's uh, been rolled out for small business and freelance economy that helps smooth out that econ the, the, the effect of that. And this is kind of some of the things that we need to start thinking about as we provide financial services to this economy. So um, I think by now I think you've seen the picture, right? There's the times are changing, jobs are changing, um, income 
and the way that the sources of income and the timing around that income are all changing, but the traditional financial services associated with that haven't changed as fast. Here's the problem. If we don't do it, and collectively in this room, I think it's up to us to do it. If we don't do it, it's going to happen to us. So let's just take a look at Airbnb. Um, what they've done to the hotel industry, it happened to them, and it happened quickly. But an even greater example is Uber. So there's still taxis and limo companies that are trying to sit around and think, how did that happen to us? There was no chance that we didn't have the services that people were looking for. Well, you had the services, but you didn't have the frictionless payment associated with it and the easy app to get picked up when you wanted to drop off and that awkward exchange at the end of it all, people wanted it, they kept asking for it and you never delivered it to them and so they made it happen themselves. Even Netflix, um, when you think about that, it's changed the way that we consume content and cable companies and other TV and movie providers now have to think differently about what people want to watch because they will watch what they want to watch in the form that they want to watch it on the type of tablet phone or TV, heaven forbid you actually have a TV in your house, um, and they're going to change the way things are done. So the way that I look at this is financial services are primed for this type of disruption. And unless we as a collective um, group change the way and give people what they need in order to help at least at a minimum smooth out this requirement for consistent income, this is gonna, something's going to change to all of us um, and new disruptions will occur. So just very quickly, some of the sort of things that I've been thinking about that we can do quickly is we, sh we need to establish a people-first approach. So more of a people-centric type approach rather than what's good for us as an organization, I think we have to think about what's good for um, what people want and how can we deliver those services to them in a form that they want and make it mobile and make it accessible and make it consistent to them. Some of the things that I, I kind of like about um, some things that I'm seeing around, around the world, at least in PayPal, I'm going to refer to the, to the U.S. Uh, consumer uh, credit program. Um, we offer, in a very different underwriting strategy, we offer a six-month uh, loan to consumers that does not incur interest over the period of that loan. Does, um, if, if, the, if the consumer pays the loan back within the six months, there's absolutely no charge. And the repeat on that is almost 87%. People just pay off their loans, there's no charge, and then they come back and they apply again and they get it again. And this is helping to smooth out this, this, um, the inconsistency that's required in an income where there's no cost associated with it and they're getting it all online 24-7 when they want it. Um, I think the second thing that, I, that the second thing um, that is we have to think about about income differently. We have to think that that it, we have to start thinking it over longer period of times rather than kind of consistent. Okay, well, you're getting this every two weeks, and this is how you want it, and this is um, and we're going to uh, decide on loans, and we're going to decide on on giving you access to money based on consistent income, no, I think we're gonna to have to look at that over wider periods of time and better understand what a small business is going through or what some of the consumers are going through, particularly as they go through some of these work transitions um, that will see some dips in income and then come back to life and support them in their transition strategies as potentially 50% of them will be disrupted over the next uh, 10 years. Finally, I just think that we have to prioritize convenience. Um, so, so we've seen this growth in digital. A mobile first strategy is what's succeeding in the market today. There's a lot of companies that are just moving into the app only space. Um, the majority uh, of millennials and, 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 and even all Canadians for that, for that matter are using apps. When you think about um, even the CBA has recently said 33% of Millennials in Canada predominantly use a banking app to do all of their financial services. They've said that 90% um, of all Canadians used online banking at least once last year. So 90% are using it at least once last year. This is how people want to use it. They want the convenience of doing it. I'll give you an example um, in the UK um, where we have uh, business loans uh, for one year now. Um, 
they transacted with PayPal uh, 1 billion pounds in the year, um, and there was 37,000 loans given out. But that's not the important stat. The important stat is of those loans, 70% of them were applied for and given outside of normal banking hours. And that's the piece that I think is how we need to be thinking differently about this. So as a final wrap up, no one can do it by themselves. It's only gonna be done if we do this as a group. There's no one player that can solve this issue. We can't just turn to the banks and say, banks, you have to solve this, this is your problem. It's gonna be required that we all work together and we work in partnerships. And most importantly, if we do this well, I think we can improve the financial health of Canadians. Thank you. Thank you.